I did not do very much cooking, and actually it was my dad that did most of the cooking. My mom generally was the one helping my sister and me with homework. Um, and um, I personally did not cook a whole lot with my parents. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just because like my dad's a bit of a control freak. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, he was the one that, that cooked the most in our house. and. Um, yeah, and, and, and sort of still does. Uh, my mom will, will chime in every now and then, but you know, they, they have a few things that they, they like to do. But yeah, this was one of the first recipes that I learned um, when I moved out of my parents' house to start my master's at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. It was just one of those things where it was a lot of sandwiches at the very beginning, but when I started to get more nostalgic for home, the first thing I wanted was fried rice. So I went on YouTube and, and, and searched up like uh, chicken fried rice recipes. And the first one that I saw that was you know, on the shorter end of a tutorial was sort of the basis of, of this of this recipe. So we can provide that link uh, at, at some point too, but. Yeah, the meat cooking that I did was always just like, um, I was just gonna be my mom's hands and like, so I just felt like a, a tool basically. So I don't, I didn't remember any of the recipes or anything, and stuff like that in high school. Yeah, but, but that being said, a lot of this cooking that, that I do is like, I, I you, I, I, I eyeball everything. <laughs> I do too. I'm the same way. And that's why I wanted, to, one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show um, oh. was that the show for me is not about following a recipe. It's about playing around with a recipe and figuring out what you like in the kitchen, what you don't like. Because yeah. you realize that when you, when you start to realize that uh, following a recipe is a, is something that you do because you're, um, because I feel like people who, who have to follow a recipe perfectly are actually not that comfortable in the kitchen, right? Mm. Um, because the uh, really being creative in the kitchen is how you start to fall in love with it, I think. Mm. Um, but in terms of fried rice specifically, uh, a lot of my understanding of it is that it's just used as a way to get rid of leftovers in a way that's just like better than just microwaving them. Yeah, for um, sure. A lot of the, the fried rice rep recipes that I've seen recommend that you use leftover rice. So, so rice that you would pr pr uh, prepare for like a meal the day before and like put it in the fridge so that this sort of, uh, the rice ends up being a little bit drier. So when you, you fry it um, uh, or whatever, sometimes if you leave it in the pan for a little bit longer, you can get a little bit crispier just because there's less of that moisture content. In terms of like my own taste for food, I'm very easy to please. Either give me a lot of it or like give me a little bit of something that's really good. But at least with our cooking, a lot of it is like homey, simple things that we sort of like experiment a little bit with. So yeah. like but um, the chili has been a nice launching point because we just like <laughs> combine it on so many things, like tater tots, chips, whatever, not like, you know, we get the, um, what is it called? The uh, chili on the nachos. Um, and Coney dogs. Coney dogs. We've done just so, like, there's so many things you can do with that. You're from Canada. Eric, you're from Arizona, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're, and I'm from Arizona, which is so fun because, oh, yeah. Uh, like, Eric and I have similar, you know, we're both from Arizona, and we probably, uh, like, I'm, I probably have, we probably have more mutual friends than, than we even know. Yeah, um, yeah. Because of like music things and um, yeah. but uh, you know it's one of those 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 things where like I grew up in the Southwest. Most of my food memories are Southwest related, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then also being Jewish, I have like Jewish things that I like bagels and and stuff like that. Um, and so I'm just curious, like growing up in Canada and then growing up in Arizona, like how that influenced your food. Um, your food uh, backgrounds, but the, but also like growing up, you know, not in a white household, right? Yeah, sure, you wanna take this one? Oh, um, sure. Uh, I guess like, I think mainly, you know, I was eating like Chinese dishes, uh, my, either my mom, my mom was cooking for a while and then my dad started to, um, but yeah, a lot of these, honestly, like a lot of these Midwest staples, I didn't touch until I pretty much got to college or got to hear. So I went to um, college at Northwestern was also in the Midwest, you know, so like the, all the like, um, I mean, I didn't eat a lot of 
I, I didn't have like the mac and cheese and like the um, other some of the re other recipes that we've been doing um, until a lot later. And like most of my days were, <clears throat> I mean, if we were gonna do anything American, it would be like a steak and some rice, and then with the touch of like Asian uh, vegetable, so like a bok choy or something. Um, so it'd be it'd be a weird kind of fusion like that because like um, you know my dad my dad likes steak or and um, but you know as far as American dishes we wouldn't venture too far into that realm. So I'm I'm using a cast iron skillet. What are you using? I, I'm using a saucepan just because like the walls of it are, are pretty high and and just so that as I'm stirring, um, you also use a lot more than I am. <laughs> Yeah, we, so we've got uh, six scoops or three cups of rice, and, and usually that's good for like us for a couple of days. So uh, another part of my philosophy in the kitchen is using the fewest amount of dishes to make the maximum amount of food. Right. Uh, Absolutely. I agree, I agree with that. In the, in the first step of the fried rice, uh, this is a step that I often tell people is that you want the, the as you heat up the pan, that's when you want to put the eggs in just because you don't want to overcook the eggs. And then when you cook the eggs, you only cook them to bit about like 70, 80 percent. So they end up end up being, being pretty runny at this part of the process so that you can take it out and reintegrate them later on in the in the process. Yeah. Um, so uh, on my end, my, my eggs are looking just about ready. Like uh, I know in our footage, it's going to look really runny, but that's OK. So um, I'm going to separate that out, clear out the pan and re oil it to get the, the chicken ready to go. And so the whole point here is that um, now that the pan is hot and ready for the chicken, and so we sort of optimize the usage of the pan um, with, um, oh, right. and the idea here is that you want to get rid of all the pink showing. You don't want to, you, you don't want to cook all the chicken all the way, but you just don't want any raw um, chicken touching anything else right at this point. I'm just going to increase the heat here. And you know, if there's a little bit of egg left in the pan, that's fine too. That'll just cook through and... Yeah, for sure. Okay. The idea is that we're just using one pan to do everything. Cool. So while, while we're cooking this chicken through, um, let's go back to the, the other food question for Jeff. Um, sure. So you grew up in Toronto, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, so, like, what food staples from Toronto um, do you have um, as part of your, you know, your own cultural identity? Um, yeah, um, so growing up in Toronto, um, it's a place where it, it, like, we're very proud to be a very big cultural hub. So a lot of, like, culture is just coming together. together. So, like, like uh, Eric was saying, there's a lot of fusion um, a lot of really interesting things going on, a lot of local stuff. Um, but where I grew up was the population was like maybe 95 to 97% Chinese. So growing up, I ate a lot of Asian food. Um, it ate uh, a lot of Chinese food, a lot of Vietnamese food. Korean food is becoming more and more popular up there. Japanese has always been a thing. Um, so that, that was mostly my diet growing up. So anyway, um, at this point, the, yeah, yeah, the chicken is ready. Um, so I'm gonna, so the I'm gonna throw the frozen veggies right now. So the point of this is to have like heat coming out from the chicken in the pan, put the frozen vegetables on top of the chicken so that warms up quicker, and then sandwich that between uh, a layer of rice so everything just cooks much faster. Yeah, for sure. So I am using frozen peas because Great. Uh, you can't have fried rice without carrots and peas. Right. Oh, yeah, we have this mix of carrots, peas, um, corn, corn, yeah. Yeah, so mine is, uh, so I'm using frozen peas, because um, peas are one of the few vegetables where it doesn't make ever make sense to buy not frozen. Mm. Uh, but carrots, I always have carrots on hand, um, like just raw carrots, just because like, I just have them on hand. Um, and then I'm using... Um, I'm throwing in jalapeno actually, because I oh, for that kick for that little bit of spiciness because I love spicy. Um, I also like to kind of add a little Southwest to everything I do. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, and then I'm actually using a bell pepper just because of that. 
uh, nice. for color. Um, I love colorful food. Um, and then I'm also going to throw in some, um, some fresh garlic. Great. Oh. Um, this is the point where if I was making a vegetarian option of the fried rice for my friends, this is, this is now when I would incorporate the pineapple. I and mean, when I really want to spoil myself, I, I put in pineapple myself too. Um, yeah, so. I, I, brought, I bought pineapple as well. Yeah, that was for, for me, that was an inspiration from that, that pho 88 place um, that I was talking about in, in back home. And when they served pineapple ch fried, uh, chicken fried rice, they actually served it in a pineapple. So that was actually kind of funny uh, okay. set up. I, I would drain the, the pineapple if you're getting it out of a can or whatever, um, just so that the whole texture doesn't become too watery yeah, and the, sure. or the rice doesn't become too sticky. Um, but, you know, it, it's personal preference at this point. One of the things that I wanted to talk about with you both was your, um, you know, living together um, <laughs> the and living together in quarantine and performing, you know, deciding to start playing more together. Um, yeah. How much were you playing together before quarantine? Because I know you both are in your own quartets. You both are in, have your own projects. Um, so how much do you? How much were you playing before, and now how much are you playing together now? I, I will be honest. I, I haven't had a whole lot of opportunity to play with Eric this year. I mean, mm -hmm. both of our quartets, especially Group Two, uh, Eric's group, has been especially proactive with getting these performance opportunities. But uh, and and the most that I've ever played with Eric was in band. Um, a lot but, of band and maybe sax ensemble a little bit. Um, yeah, but. Yeah. I mean, recently we've just been like, you know, reading duets together and that's been a lot of fun. I think that's been the, you know, the most we've been doing since we started living together. Yeah, and it's been really nice. Uh, I, I will say I'm very grateful and I tell him this every day that I'm very grateful to be stuck in quarantine with my best friend. <laughs> just because, you know, I, I, I would consider myself an introverted person, but to get through these extended periods of time is just really nice. Oh, the click went. Um, it's just... It's just really nice to be around someone that's got such similar um, um, interests, um, has the same appetite for food, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, well, and it seems perfect. Like, it, you, I will say, like, it's been so delightful, like, just watching you both be together and cooking together and creating together. And, and it, it was just an immediate thing for me that I was like, okay, they're coming on this show. <laughs> Oh. Well, yeah, and, and, and one thing that I think is important to mention about that is that I think in terms of living with another person in this time, I, I know other people are, you know, you know, you hear about the statistics of like people getting angry with their roommates or their partners. Um, I, I think with Eric and, and I, we've been able to set in, to settle into a routine where we sort of balance out this like, you know, cooking together, but also being able to leave each other alone so that we can pursue our own projects so mm. like for example like we wake up in the morning and the first thing that we do together is like a yoga session um and then we'll make breakfast together but then we'll almost immediately break off to do our own like work on the computer or practice and and so then and then reconvene for lunch but if someone needs time to like pursue something else or it, it's, it's just that we've been able to balance that alone versus together time so that you know we don't drive each other crazy Sticky rice. Yeah, and at this point, with the bed of rice on top of everything, I put the sauces in. So what okay. I like to do is spiral in some soy sauce, and I just draw a little whoop. And a little uh, Naruto action. A little Naruto action, and then for the people that can handle the spice, I like to. The secret's in the sriracha, apparently. That's what I said, didn't I? Mm. And then. Um, as a shout out to Connor James Mikula, he loves sesame oil, so we're just gonna toss a little bit of. Oh, I have some of that. Yeah, I'm gonna try it. Yeah, not a lot, just just a little bit. But, yeah. but so at this point, yeah, we're just integrating everything together, um, just to make sure everything's cooked through, and that um, the indicator of that is making sure that the sauces and the coloring, um, you want everything to look like a, a, a homogeneous, in it, or the color of the rice should all be sort of like brown ing because of the sauce distribution but also the frying process um yeah and you just want to integrate everything so that you know you get a really colorful looking dish i definitely should have used the bigger pan 
<laughs> yeah, with, with fried rice, you want to make sure that the pan has enough real estate for you to be able to push things around and that the walls of the pan are high enough so that you don't like spill everything over. Yeah. I learned that very quickly. <laughs> the, the, so the last time when I've been cooking this on my own, I cooked it, I cooked like a quarter of what you, uh, yeah. of what you done. This time I just halved it, right? Ah. Uh, and even that, my cast iron is a little, is a little full right now, but that's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just make sure the movements are small. Uh, a, a thing to keep noting is you want to make sure that as you're moving the spatula that you're scraping the bottom of the pan so that um, you're, you're keeping stuff from burning and sticking to the pan. Um, some people like having those crunchy bits um, to their fried rice. Um, for me, I, I don't because that means it's a harder cleanup. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, there's that option is that you can let it sit for a little bit for it to develop that like crunchy crust. Um, but if you plan to keep it moving, make sure that you're keeping rice and eggs at the bottom of the pan. Um, so at this point, I'm going to reintegrate the eggs. So wherever you were storing it before, I, I'm going to throw it back in. And so now, um, it, now we're, we can cook that all the way through and they'll prevent the eggs from being like too dry. Yeah, we're just integrating that into the mixture now and it's almost ready. Almost ready to serve. Yeah. And I, I like what I like about the runniness a little bit there is that it sort of seeps into the rice a little bit. You get the yolk stained rice. Yeah. The thing about fried rice is that it's such an open thing. I mean, it was a dish that was designed, I think, to deal with like a lot of uh, my, my my dad calls it must go. So a lot of must it's, go. It's like your your leftovers that you need to get rid of, and and, and that makes uh, the variations on fried rice very uh, colorful. Uh, the, the repertoire is yours. <laughs> Choose your own adventures, as I like to call it. Yeah, so we're ap approaching done here, actually. I don't know how you're doing, Spencer. Um, it's getting there. It's, it's nearly there. It probably has um, another minute or two, but that's okay. Yeah, but I mean, um, this dish is, I don't think it takes a lot of time to prepare as long as you sort of like you know, prep the things appropriately. Because yeah. it's just it's just throwing stuff into a pan and, and that's why I like I like this so much because it it's one of those dishes that there's really not a like there isn't that much of an excuse to not try it, right? Try cooking sure, it. Yeah. Because it's not that hard, right? Um it's super simple. You don't even have to chop anything up if you don't want to, other yeah. than chicken. And any and even then, you don't even have to chop up chicken. Um, yeah. you do it entirely vegetarian or if you, um, you know, something that I tried, uh, was I didn't have chicken one day. And so I tried it with ground turkey. Um, and I know that's like, not, that's different, but it, I tried it and it, it worked really well, actually it tasted yeah. better. Um, it's a really flexible dish, I think. Mm. Yeah. Really so flexible. And, um, you know, it's even changing out the procedure, you can, you can change up a lot for it. And it'll still work. And what I love about this is that it makes a lot of, of food at one time. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I have food for three days now. This might last yeah. us, like, two meals. There's also two of us to feed. Yeah, there's also two of us. So, you know, that, that recipe. Also double, had double as much as I did. Yeah, and, and I will say, while, while I, Eric is one of my best friends, he's also one, also one of the worst things that happened to my waistline. <laughs> What are you talking about? You guys are both in great shape. Uh, <laughs> my, my pants disagree. I want to talk a little bit about your your practice as performers um, and the things that you are really excited, the projects that you're really excited about right now, um, <laughs> and the uh, you know, and maybe a little, just a little bit about how you got to you know, start. Why did you pick the saxophone? So like. Uh, let's start with that. Why did you pick the saxophone? Like my other colleagues, saxophone was something that happened early on in band, but I was sort of late to the game in that band for my particular school didn't start until seventh grade. That was so, me too. Yeah, so, so when seventh grade came around, I was like, oh, let's try to pick instruments. And so um, my, my father uh, played trumpet through high school and college and still does in community uh, ensembles. Um, so when it came time to pick an instrument, I was like, oh, dad, wouldn't it be cool if I played trumpet? And so uh, he gave me his trumpet to try. I remember trying to play two notes and he just rips the instrument out of my hand. He's like, that's too bad. Go pick something else. 
Um, so um, I, I, I picked the instrument that most closely resembled a brass instrument that didn't have a buzzing mechanism. So uh, that's how I ended up on saxophone and, and somehow ended up being decent at it from the beginning. Um, and, you know, was very fortunate to have great uh, mentors in the elementary through high school band programs. But, you know, I was largely self-taught until I got into the University of Toronto. Um, you know, I had great music mentors, but no one to translate how to do that on the saxophone. So um, that, that was you definitely know, a process. Well, you know, Robin Makesons uh, was my first guest, so. The yeah, yeah. Uh, she and I played together at the University of Toronto a couple of years uh, in the new music ensembles and stuff. So she's really wonderful. Hi, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully she's watching. Uh, yeah. uh, um, but anyways, um, cool. Um, what, about, what about you, Eric? Yeah, uh, so I've, uh, I guess it's uh, also start, kind of started with my dad. Um, my, <laughs> he loves Kenny G. And um, we would listen to like you know those Kenny G CDs on road trips and everything and uh, I started out on piano but um, I think we also f found that you know a lot of the kids in the Asian community they it's like piano violin as the <laughs> classic um, and just for me I, I wanted to do something a little bit different I, I felt it was important to like for me to be uh, you know not try to go against the stereotypical image a little bit. And uh, also, I think, you know, the more my dad saw, uh, he saw that Bill Clinton also played the saxophone. So I was just, yeah, you should really play saxophone. So, you know, me and my friends, we all actually agreed to play saxophone together. Um, and I ended up being the only one that kept kept it going throughout. But um, yeah, that's, that's how it all started. So thank you, Kenny G. <laughs> Kenny G. <laughs> I uh, think my, my dad wasn't too happy with uh, uh, the music that I ended up playing now, but you know, <laughs> you, you, you win some, you lose some. Yeah. Although, you know, you've been doing, you know, some of the stuff you do with group two. Um, yeah. Some of that stuff, I mean, that's closer to Kenny G than some of the other stuff that you play. Yeah. Like the pop, the pop transcriptions and stuff. And honestly, like I'm excited to just to play, like honestly, sometimes playing just Chinese tunes that are with the karaoke backing track that's more satisfying than anything <laughs> you know that I will say also about you know karaoke and I'm um, hearing some of the Chinese pop tunes um uh when I was living with the Singapore roommates we would go do uh karaoke um in I think we were doing it in Koreatown but I can't yeah. remember in, in New York but the um but we would do uh this karaoke. I'm gonna add a little bit more sriracha to mine. Cause yeah, because mm -hmm. um, I think that it will look pretty. Um, it certainly does. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah. Um, and then I'm adding a little green onion. Oh Ooh. yeah. Um, get it. Get it. Chopsticks or fork? Chopsticks. Go with the chopsticks. 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 The all-purpose tool. Yeah. Because I actually own my own chopsticks. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah um, well, one thing I guess my, my, my dad would want people to know is, uh, is like, uh, if, if I could give like a free chopstick lesson. Yeah. Is that the misconception is that a lot of people think that both of the chopsticks are in motion when you use them, but... Oh, it's just the top one. It's just the top one. So yeah. for That's a lot of people... Yeah. yeah. So for me, um, I, I, I put the, the chopstick in... I, I'm right-handed. Okay. So then I, I, I put the sort of top half of the chopstick in, in, in my right hand, uh, supported by the ring finger and, and the thumb over here so that you have these opposing forces so it's balanced. Okay. You know, and that one never moves. That one never moves. And then um, the second chopstick, you sort of imagine if you're trying to write with a pencil, like uh, the grip over here, that's what I would imagine the top uh, part to be. And see how mobile that can be? Yeah. Yeah. So now... The, the trick now is, is holding the, the bottom chopstick here and then inserting the top thing on top. And then, look, uh, I don't know if you can see, but my, my top can... chopstick is incredibly mobile. And so I can even pick up like a small P. And you know. Ooh. So, yeah. so the top one is the only one that moves. And that's, um, there you go, Spencer's got it. Anyways, I'm going to take the first bite. Do it, please. Mm -hmm. Cheers. 
Anyways, okay. Oh my god, that's so good. Like, I eat chicken, vegetables, and rice, like, at least two or three times a week already. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it, can, it gets kind of boring sometimes. Um, and I, you know, the one thing that I do is I use different spices and stuff. Uh, yeah. Over the course of, um, I use different spices and stuff to just, like, make it not boring. But just having a different preparation method. Yeah, for sure. It's such a great, great way of adding another meal to my, my canon of, of things. And this is something that I would probably create, like do at least once or twice a month. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. For, for me, this was my, my, my dish of choice. Um, it would be the dish I would make for myself. It would be what I would make for potlucks. If I was oh, trying to impress someone, I would make fried rice, but <laughs> you know, like when I'm trying to impress Eric, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, oh, okay, and it's something cool. that you can cook together like quite nicely. So if you're, if you're, you and your partner want to try something new, there, there's always something that they could be helping with at the same time, to save time, but to also stay involved in, as equal tr contributors to cooking. I, I think that's a real fun thing to do is, is to be cooking with someone. Because um, then there, there's a very tangible product that you both had a handle in. And it's a great, great, great way to just be together, I guess. So, mm. um, yeah, so group two has been like really killing it recently. Um, can you like so what what everything have you because like, you've won a bunch of stuff mm. you've um yeah we've well, won some stuff yeah so um, you've been posting social media stuff recently you mm. the you know the the different ar pop arrangements that you've done yeah I went, to, I went to Eric's concert um like when was this was this in February um like, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. But like right. the last, like you're one of the last concerts that I got to go to. I, that's not really yeah. true because I went to NASA and two music festivals before that. So who am I talking about? But you were <laughs> probably one of the last concerts I went to in East Lansing or in Lansing, mm -hmm. um, and uh, at home. And, and that, um, and it was such a great concert. It really was. I Thank really you. enjoyed it. It was very, it was very engaging because it, um, you know, the way that they presented this concert was as if. Um, you know, they did it in multiple sets. Yeah. There was yeah. lots of, you know, there was lots of time to go get a drink. Uh, there was right. lots of the conversation. <laughs> and they came back and talked to us in between sets. Mm -hmm. I loved that aspect. Like, it was just like, this is like how every concert I want to be at. Yeah. Um, like, just the format. And, it, and I just want to know, if, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so that was something we, you know, we were given this block of like two hours, basically, I and mean, like, well, we don't really want to be playing the whole time. And this is really more of a thing for the community even. So like, as much as we get to play, like at least we'll get to talk to our friends too and meet people and, and talk to people. And so we decided to put in like three breaks, I believe, um, 15 minute, 20 minute breaks that we just go, we play, you know, and, and um, then we talk and mingle. And like, I think part of it too is that you know, we, we sit through these hour and a half long recitals with like a little bit of intermission. I think, I just think it, with the style that we have um, and the different genres that we tend to play, it's nice to, first of all, break it up into sections that way, but also, uh, but also have, keep, keep people's attention spans for the time that we are performing. So that, that was a lot of the consideration that went into that. Um, uh, currently, you know, we, we sort of went to the, through this whole competition cycle and not that we didn't do well, but that we, we didn't do like perhaps as well as we'd hoped, um, like made finalists for a couple things, um, uh, was able to win what, uh, one of the, one of the competitions in new Orleans, which was really nice. Um, but that was of course ended up being over, over virtual, uh, yeah, over, over, um, online interface. But <clears throat> So we kind of came back and we were like hungry to do more stuff. But then all of a sudden it was like, bam, okay, you can't rehearse anymore. Like we, and uh, you have to stay home. So, you know, we even tried to get into the building once. And then, you know, of course we were kicked out, <laughs> uh, which is fair. <laughs> <laughs> but so now, you know, we're trying to wrap up all of the loose ends of being an ensemble business wise that needs to be done. But like a lot of, groups I think don't get to because of how busy they are and rehearsing and blah, blah, blah. So if we can tie up all these sort of putting out content, putting on, um, 
using our social media, uh, getting established that way, and have it all set up before we start to rehearse again, it's going to give us a little bit of a, a more peace of mind and like ease to, to really focus in on the music once we can actually play together again. And that's part of the reason why we're doing this podcast too. It's like a way to spend time with each other and then like a way to uh, release content while and work while we're not um, able to play together. Yeah. Where can people find your podcast? Yeah. So uh, group2.com, uh, group2quartet.com is, is our website and there's uh, uh, a section where you can get into the podcast or you can just go to our Facebook page, group 2 um, uh, I, I believe it's the, the backward slash is like group two quartet or something like that. Uh, just group two saxophone quartet or something. I'm sure it'll pop up, but we typically release our podcasts on that platform as well. And yeah, we're hoping to maybe release a couple more pop transcriptions or something before, uh, as we keep doing this as well. Um, but those are just some of the things that are in the works. Love to play my quartet. Oh yeah. 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 I think I've sent it to, I don't know if I've sent it to you, but I, I know Jeff has it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, let me, let me. I, yeah. I'll have to well, dig, dig for that. I, I, if you, if you sent it, I have it and I've played a lot of your music, Spencer. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say I'm a little selfish with also liking having Jeff on the show. Um, <laughs> because Jeff has probably played more individual pieces of mine than anybody. Mm. Uh, Maybe. And, I, and what I mean by that is, is like, there's people who've played pieces of mine and like have played it more than once, but um, very few people have played multiple pieces of mine, um, you know, on either on different instruments or whatever. Although I think everything has been on alto. Um, Most of the stuff I've done is on alto, if I'm remembering correctly. And I'm very grateful that like we've been able to, you know, work in the capacity that we have, like even before MSU, right? Um, having our connection through Dr. McAllister, even in, even though that was like like temporally distant, yeah. but to end up at MSU together was just a really wonderful experience. And we even got to TA together. Yeah, Jeff and I got to uh, uh, TA first semester music theory together. Um, and it was actually, I will say, it was really nice for me as a new doctoral student um, to start that process with somebody that I had met before and had known for actually quite a while. Um, nobody, yeah. I didn't know anybody else at, um, at MSU other than, other than the composition faculty. Um, <laughs> and so yeah. Jeff was really it. And, and it was, so it was really nice. And, and I think that that first semester, we, we both kind of like helped each other out a little bit um, because- well, You helped me out a lot, Spencer. More, it can more be overwhelming. More. It can be overwhelming, uh, you know, all the grading and <laughs> <laughs> all the great yeah, all, all the, the great grading. that's the thing i remember the most from that, from that yeah yeah wow. uh, that, that was a really tough time in my doctorate the the first semester of my second year because that would have been the first time mm -hmm. like the degrees overlapped for me so i started at msu as a saxophone uh, dma student and then was was re really fortunate to be invited to be uh, to apply for the music theory program and and so i was doing a lot of catch-up in my first year of the theory degree, second year of the DMA, and I had to learn very quickly how to be efficient with my time, um, just because I was a theory TA, so I had obligations for the class I was great uh, uh, teaching for, but I also was catching up with uh, coursework for the theory degree, I had all the expectations of, of being a doctoral student in performance, so uh, that year in particular, I learned how to be very effective with my practice time, with how I was reading, with the time that I was spending, um, it was certainly the, I, I would um, say it was the toughest semester at MSU so far. Mm. Um, um, but it certainly allowed me to be a much more functional person afterwards. Um, this was my toughest semester, I will say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the novelty of the, of, of being a doctoral student wears off and second year is sort of like, you're sort of like, making that plan, like, what am I going to do after this degree? And then especially if you start the theory degree, it's like that whole other uh, um, onslaught of coursework, which is great. Um, I, I, I will uh, say the theory degree was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, but I would do it again because of the people I got to meet and the conversations that I got to be a part of because the community at MSU is such a vibrant and wonderful place. 
Um, I certainly started here on the saxophone track mind, um, but having worked with the variety of people in the theory area has certainly opened up my perspective and I really think fundamentally changed me as a musician and pedagogue, uh, especially mm. having worked with like Dr. Van Handel and Dr. Callahan. They, they were, they, I, I list them as my mentors on my, my own documents as a educator, performer, for sure. What is going on with, uh, with you, Jeff, with all the different things that you're doing? You're, you do like a million different things, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think like, like everyone uh, going through the, in the lockdown right now, there's a, we've had to modify a lot of our plans. Um, you know, like a couple weddings I was planning to attend this summer have either been postponed or canceled. Um, the, the main um, music festival that I was looking forward to, uh, the Maryland Chamber Winds, is now officially switched over to an online platform. Uh, we're looking to host a very superstar lineup of composers um, to write pieces that are going to be digitally premiered um, later this summer. Um, and, and, and that's sort of like the big thing for me right now. Um, I'm, I'm still teaching virtually online. Um, I'm recording a couple master classes for some band directors, both in Canada and in, in the US. So I've been spending a lot of time in my room with my microphones, um, um, practicing a bunch of stuff. Um, I, I will say it's been very difficult to stay motivated during this time period. And I'm sure I'm not the only one that that's feeling that, but you know, finding these short based projects for recordings and stuff has been helpful. Um, living with Eric's been great because he does a fair amount of jazz. So I've been working on like diving into jazz really for the first time ever. Um, I played in jazz band through high school and in, in some in my undergrad. But, um, you know, I, I, over this quarantine, I just figured um, I want to try my hand at something new. Um, so this jazz thing has been interesting. Um, I'm still obsessed over my sound. I just sound like a classical guy trying to play jazz, which is exactly what I am. Can you just briefly talk about Novus and what is Novus and what uh, uh, what is happening with that right now with quarantine and how do you see that as part of your uh, your profile of job things that you do? Novus right now is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the expansion of the saxophone repertoire and promoting emerging artists, and uh, we've done that in a number of ways. Um, originally, it was a platform for a lot of people to organize consortiums, to compose, um, to commission new music, connecting performers with composers that they might not normally be able to. Uh, since then, we've sort of embraced um, a much wider definition of this project, or of, this, of our mission statement by uh, getting involved with um, education projects. So like the Nova Spark project, where we've um, provided cost-free lessons to students in the Flint area. And then last year we launched our Women in Music campaign to sort as a response to um, the sort of demographic that was that wasn't represented in our uh, first call for scores competition. So that became a year-long project, including interviews, statements from professional music makers by people who identified as female, and then culminated in a concert featuring uh, music uh, by women for for women. Um, and so um, since then, um, Connor has had won a really incredible job on the, the lottery of, of military band um, placements, I would say, and is now in Washington in the president's own Marine band. And so having him move out to Washington, we sort of had to figure out how to restructure how we're going to operate as an organization. Um, so um, that might mean moving Nova Spark towards the DC area where his resources are. And I don't know where I'm going to be in the immediate future, so uh, I, my stuff is sort of on hold. But as it stands during the quarantine, we're, we're still uh, we're restructuring things to sort of see how we can um, still operate within our, um, our um, mission statement. And as it stands, I think we're going to try to move back to our original model of trying to be able to write more grants to sort of fund projects and that kind of thing. But all, all of that is still sort of up in the air. Um, but yeah, thank you for asking. Um, I know a lot of people have been very curious because it's sort of been very under the radar uh, over the last few months. But as Connor's transition to like his um, new chapter of his life with his now uh, wife, <laughs> um, and, and for me uh, approaching the end of my uh, terminal degree, um, we're, we're going to start to shift our focus, but maybe going back to the origins of the, the organization. Yeah. 
I will say shout out to Connor for the recent video he posted. I shared it on my Facebook. The he did a arrangement from it was Undertale. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was really good. It, it it was relevant to the composition lesson I was teaching, where he was trying to arrange a video game soundtrack for saxophone quartet. Oh. Um, like literally, we were talking about that, and like I didn't have Facebook open, but I was looking for. Uh, actually, I was looking for Group Two's video um, <laughs> for your arrangement, just because yeah. um, he's uh, so he's starting. He is uh, recently became a drum major for a drum corps, um, and oh. he, um, you know, obviously drum corps is who knows what's going on right now. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, the all, I, all apparently all the drum majors for this drum corps are all saxophonists, which I suppose makes sense because they also be in drum corps, but. They don't play brass instruments. Yeah, they gotta, yeah. yeah. So they all play saxophone. So he, the, they, I guess there's five of them, which I thought was seems like a lot. Um, but he, uh, um, because they all play saxophone, they decided, why don't you? And since you're a composer, why don't you do some arranging of some pop tunes um, or something for five saxophones? And I was like, I know people who are doing that. <laughs> so I sent I sent him Group Two's video, um, and then like as I was looking for that, I saw Connor's video, and I was like, "Hey, you should see this because yeah. he, he's also like very into video game music." Um, and so he was uh, arra he's arranging a Donkey Kong turn a Country Returns soundtrack or whatever. I don't I, I, the whatever it was um, for saxophone quintet, and um, mm. the and so I was like. Hey, here you go. Here are people who are doing this. Study this. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was really great to have those resources to share. Like in that almost immediate, it was the perfect perfect thing to share at that time. So thank you, Connor. Um, yes, yeah, Connor is is just putting them out there. It's it's really great. Yeah, um, and a lot of people like the, the sort of like you were saying, Spencer, the abundance of resources that have been made available to to us that normally might might not have been shared. Um, it's been really nice to see not just the saxophone community, but a lot of uh, uh, people in you know your Facebook communities just coming together to sort of support each other through this tough time.